I'm Aaron Weintraub, and this is Inside Kurdistan. You can judge a society on a lot of different metrics. Uh, Most of the time, people judge societal success on sort of a balance between public and private sector effectiveness and efficiency. Uh, If the economy is strong and the government is popular, that's a society that's moving in the right direction. Uh, Now, there are, of course, gaps in this logic, uh, so I'm going to propose an alternative metric. Uh, I think that the health of a culture is judged by how communities within it treat the most vulnerable populations. And you might think I mean the homeless uh, or the mentally and physically handicapped or the elderly, and these are all good demographics to watch for. Uh, But I'm actually going to point to another area that goes overlooked a lot of the time. The success and health and progress of a society can be judged by how the people in it treat their animals. Whether those animals are livestock, pets, strays, uh, if they're animals used for labor or to promote social status, uh, if the abuse they sustain comes from a cultural or religious reason uh, or maybe industrial reasons, these are all standards uh, that Kurdistan is only just starting to grapple with. Ashti Farakadin is one of the leading animal activists in Kurdistan, and she's helped establish the first animal shelter in the region. And she's now helping with pushing through legislation uh, for animal protection in Kurdistan's parliament, along with uh, Dr. Suleiman Tamir from Dohuk, uh, who drafted the legislation. And when we spoke, that legislation had actually just been submitted and was under review. So we spoke about some of the need for regulation for animal care in Kurdistan, as well as a few of the issues regarding animal abuse here, in particular dog fighting and illegal importation. Uh, But we also spoke just generally about animal rights and how it's perceived here and what's changed in the past 10 years and what still needs to change in the next 10. Uh, So with that, I'll just turn it over to our interview. Here's what she had to say. Ashti Falakadin, thank you so much for coming in. You're welcome. I thought it would be good for us to just talk about uh, your own background. You grew up with animals. Yeah. Yeah. Kind what, of. Yeah. Well, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Since I, my childhood, I had a passion for the animals and taking care of them and rescue them as much as I can. We had, uh, like uh, other families in the 90s, most of us had a chicken and chicks at home. Uh, then, uh, fortunately, I had a chance to have a dog. Uh, it's been 25 years that I, I have dogs at home. So after that, I had that feeling how nice to have a pet at home and how it's friendly. Uh, then I had more and more patience for the dogs outside. And now I ended up in the farm with the 14 dog. Uh, most of them they are in special need and they were homeless. I sheltered them and five donkeys with uh, cooperating uh, an international NGO plus a horse is rescued from the other farms. I think there's kind of two spheres of uh, there's kind of pet culture and then there's livestock culture, the viewing the animals, uh, animal rights uh, for animals that are in labor, like, for example, donkeys and things like that. I was wondering if you could give me sort of the differentiation between sort of livestock rights and working animal rights and sort of pet rights and pet culture. Oh, you can find people who do this kind of stuff here. It's very few because of the, you know, uh, fir- first of all, cultural difference, economical difference, and how you're looking at the subject. This is very, very different. Like uh, now recently through the social media and through the, uh, the TVs and uh, in media in general, there is awareness uh, about it. They start working and deliver the message of how important uh, to accept animals on the earth. It's, but it's very, very new in the country. So, uh, so much difference. Like uh, you cannot find uh, very few people t- doing this uh, these things. And I think a lot of Westerners or quote unquote Westerners, Americans and Europeans will view uh, animal care here as not as developed. But we spoke we spoke before, actually. And, and I think uh, you you kind of view sort of that as a double standard. Uh, uh, and I was wondering if you could get into that a little. Yes. More. Yeah, of course. Uh, 
uh, of course, we are a developing country. We were in the war. We had more priority before, like, uh, to come into the animals. Let's be uh, realistic. At the moment, also, I am criticized by the people that, okay, uh, there is so many important things, like uh, homeless children, so many uh, old people. Just uh, recently, they dumped uh, old people on the street. And so mm-hmm. many things, education, but why you not afford for that? Why animals? So uh, we are just new. But if you compare here with the... Um, 20, 15 years or 8 years ago we are way better like so many people because we are um, coming to the country foreigners expats they, 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 the local people see how they treat their pets now we are developed and so many people have dogs like before when I put my dog in the car it was something very very weird and the people are looking at me as a stranger but now everyone have a dog who are uh, who are saying that there is uh, okay there is not um, enough care okay that's correct there is no enough care here mm-hmm. but also in Europe in the US there is a lot of uh, abu- uh, abused al- animals for example uh, the uh, pig farms I've seen some videos I couldn't sleep entire night or there is some kind of um, Ducks, they use their hair for the pillow and this stuff. Those farms are horrible. Or rabbits. Like, we don't have those farms here, for example. Mm-hmm. Okay, we we are doing farming, but mostly it is like um, um, old-fashioned. Yeah, like we've industrialized our animal abuse yes. in the West. Yeah. Uh, there is also, so also I have this word to say, there is animal abuse as well. Mm-hmm. Like, same, same, animal, yeah. animal. But uh, regarding the awareness here, we are developing. And I believe if, if um, government and uh, the social media activists, if they highlight this subject, it affect the new generation, it will be changed. I change you, you change him. So there will be different community around. So what have you seen change? You said in the past 10 to 15 years, a lot of things have changed. What specifically have you seen change, for example, here in Erbil? Okay. And even not in the most of area in Erbil, but at least around this studio, you can see many people walk their dog. Mm. Like this one w- was not available if, uh, a few years ago. It was like uh, something uh, uh, weird if you walk your dog. This one of the, the things. little Pomeranians. Yes, the little, little dogs, big <laughs> dogs. And so many vets, they open their vet care. You can have, def- trust me, you can... It was a day in this Erbil. I went into the vets and they told me, just go out, go out with your, with your dogs. You are not allowed to come mm, into the... Yeah, but now we have a vet. We have a, people are selling the supplies. So I, just, I see them as a progress. And to get into sort of, I, I made a comment about the Pomeranians, but I, I do see sort of, especially in cities, before this I was in Jordan uh, mm. and in Amman, uh, when, I, when I lived there, uh, one of the things... I noticed was it was the peak uh, Game of Thrones culture. Game of Thrones was the most popular show. Yeah. And a lot of people ended up with huskies uh, Mm -hmm. because it's a popular dog on the show uh, Mm -hmm. and it's part of the aesthetic uh, um, with the show. And here it's Pomeranians. It's this little... Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. because it's easy to, to carry. And yeah, exactly. It's a status, like it's expensive dog for people. Well, exactly. And and there's a there's a socioeconomic uh, factor to consider with, with pet care people who have time and money to yeah. care of pets more. Uh, yeah. And I was wondering if you could actually expand on that divide and, and the way that different uh, uh, socioeconomic groups here perceive as pets. Uh, as I said before, also social economy is effect, and at the same time, is not effect of the pet cares. During my experience, I've met so many people have a lot of money, and they have a dogs in the house. In the meantime, they are doing dog fighting, mm-hmm. and it really surprised me. It was weird experience for me. So, if you have a dog in house, you know those emotions and how. Uh, how beautiful creature is that? So how you do dog fighting behind the sense, you know what I mean? Behind the wall. Uh, but also there is some people have no economic situation, but they took care of the dogs for the 16, like 15 years uh, uh, period of the time. So, but in the meantime, of course, economic situation. If you have money, you can take your, you can buy an expensive dog. You can take your dog to the grooming for the vest. Uh, so many people I know recently because they are not very satisfied with the vet service here, they take their dogs outside the country for the treatments. Uh, we have these people, and we have the, so many people are the chain the dogs 
keep them up upstairs, uh, in tiny cages in the farms. Yeah. So yeah, it depends on the culture, you know, actually. And the breeding as well. Like, yeah. To bring it back to the husky Pomeranian yes. conversation, people have dogs here for breeding. It's it's a, it's a new market. That yeah, exactly. Like I uh, yeah, it is like between. Uh, I can say 10 to 8 years it started uh, this business unfortunately because we have so many stray dogs and they breed dogs here I wish one day comes and they ban this service because really so many dogs needs home and the people go and pay in purpose to buy a breed dogs like it's unfair on the dogs in general and they don't take care of them this is the problem like we in the shelter we end up with so many huskies they take them because it's cute in, in the when it's puppy, when they grew up, they cannot take them, and they just dumped on the. Well, and huskies uh, in particular, they're so high maintenance. They're yes. very high energy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'd like to circle back to something you mentioned about dog fighting. I was wondering, could you tell me a little bit about the history and culture of dog fighting here? Uh, the dog fighting, first of all, it's an illegal, illegal uh, event. Uh, it's happening here, but uh, it's uncontrollable as well because they do it somewhere not everyone can see. And this oriented uh, in between Turkey, Iran, Afghan, uh, Pakistan area. Uh, they say it's part, if you go to the dog fighter, you ask him, why are you doing that? He says it's part of our culture, but it's not true. It's not part of our culture at all. We used to use the dogs for the guarding, never for the fighting. But through dog fighting, there's a lot of money going on because they, they put money um, aside for the dogs who win or who lose or whatever. I don't know the details too much. But, uh, yeah. And uh, they train the dog to be very aggressive. They dr- I saw, uh, like, in the area of our shelter, I see the dog, they chain it with the, uh, with the tires to have a muscle and get strong and make him walk uh, kilometers was dragging the tires through his back. So mm-hmm. when I saw that um, picture, I say, what are you doing? He says, I'm preparing him for the dog fighting. And the dog was huge. Usually they use a big size, the dogs, over 30 kilograms. Um, there is a dog called Pishdar Dog Spread usually used for this dog fighting. And unfortunately, it happens every single week here, every single day somewhere around the, the region. Who attends these? Who goes to these? I mean, how are they promoted? Um, you may not believe, but very uh, strange, but so many people in different levels is attending to this, unfortunately, bad event. Uh, like, uh, even from the governmental people, when you go and claiming, uh, you claim and you say, okay, it should not happen, but you <laughs> you will see the video, he's in there, and you see, they watch the, mm-hmm. the fight. They have their own pages and people follow them. They announce the dog fighting timing and places. And the, the every dog who win have a name, of course. And the, most of people knows this name is, for example, X. This dog is have a fight and they collect. They say they mention the timing. And they collect to, in the, to the areas. Mm-hmm. As so well. it's on Facebook and things like Mostly that. it's Facebook. Yeah. And they have, I heard that there is a WhatsApp group also, a huge group. Mm. They announce there. I mean, are there regulations against this? You say it's illegal, but it's being advertised on Facebook. I haven't seen any police go catch them and put them into jail or they uh, they charge them a fine for this. I haven't seen so far. I haven't heard about it. But it's illegal. If you come to the, the legal part, it's illegal. Um, I wanted to also talk about, so that's, you know, certainly dogfighting is one aspect of uh, abuse here. But in general, if we could talk a little more about uh, regulations regarding livestock abuse as well and uh, uh, animals who work. Uh, when I went to, to the shelter uh, project from 2019, and our shelter located in the area is called the animal market, animal stock market. When I see the animals there, I have seen dogs more lucky than them. Because seriously, uh, uh, from the transportation, from the way they are selling them, from the way they keep them, uh, from the way they treating them, they are so bad, like very much bad. Uh, we have illegal animals, sick animals, in came into illegally in into the town mm-hmm. and they sell it with the less price without going through the uh, health care and health check. If they uh, and they 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 put them in the car like they load them in the car mm-hmm. like the car, if the car for example can handle like one hundred. Uh, ships they put 150 and most of them they chunk in the car 
So they just threw them away around, and you can see they are remain on the the the, the street. That broke my heart. Like how? Okay, we we know the dogs is like it's the the community they don't like it because of religious influence mm -hmm. into this and also cultural side of it. But what what about the sheep? Why nobody see that? Like uh, if you uh, if they deliver the sheep or cows from here to the cows. Uh, they need to offload them for the resting. I haven't seen them. They give them water. Like mm -hmm. how they load them, it is a, uh, was a very, very tough way. Like they hit them and it's so heartbreaking, so heartbreaking. So you mentioned uh, uh, the, the, the illegal importing of animals over the border. I was wondering if you could give me a little more insight into the black market that exists there. <laughs> Uh, here in the region, unfortunately, there is a black market for the livestock and for the other things. They sell the wild animals and the pets. Actually, you can if you if they steal your pets, you can find them there in the Friday. They mm -hmm. sell it. Uh, but this market, the black market for animals, illegally came into the town and they sell it. And if you notice, there are some some places their meat is very cheap. Because it not goes through the process of the health check and this stuff. Okay, then they sell it. Or they send it to the south of uh, Iraq, like to the Baghdad or mm -hmm. Basra and these places. Uh, so the price of those animals are cheaper than uh, the normal legally uh, animals imported to the Kurdistan because they pay taxes. They want to the, throw the health care and this stuff, the governmental process, let's say. Uh, it's available and they all know where it is, but nobody have an action about it. And how it's difficult, uh, dangerous for the animal life, uh, for human life, uh, ex uh, pardon, because uh, usual, uh, uh, daily we use meats, so it affects uh, mm -hmm. the, the human health as well, but they try to control it, but it's uncontrollable, unfortunately. So you've actually had like you've been quite busy right now um, pushing some of your own like legislation through your for regulations on on you know it's been a this. year yeah, yeah, working yeah. on it yeah could you take me through it what have you been working on yeah there is a draft uh, submitted to the parliament it's contained from the twenty nine articles it's very very wild like uh, for it contains from the animal route how they use for everything like uh, pets for the stray dogs cats farming hunting uh, wild animal the animals are rare and never allowed to be hunted everything uh, and even the the way the condition how they people need to take care of the their livestock uh, it is now under uh, the discussion and this draft is drafted by Dr. Suleiman from the Hawk. He's a vet. And he has an NGO, Animal F Animal uh, Kurdistan Corporation, something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't remember uh, exactly which the name. Um, I informed him last night. Today, the law will be under discussion finally after one year. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you so much. I hope it goes to the implementing very, very soon. And of course, without awareness, that one doesn't work. Yeah. And that's a huge thing is, you know, these laws are passed uh, and oftentimes, you know, it takes five or 10 years for them to mean anything because there's an entire population of people who are still, you know, they see, you know, they're part of WhatsApp groups for dogfighting and things like that. And that that needs to change before these laws can mean anything to anyone. Yes, exactly. What do you think needs to change in the next, you know, eight to 10 years? A new generation is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Like uh, so many things need to be changed. Not only here, worldwide. Yeah, <laughs> I wish Agreed. for a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but let's talk about the achievable uh, targets, not something like uh, hard to uh, achieve. To um, very necessary here. What I see, the community have a problem with it, and uh, um, and also animals have problem with it. It's the street animals, which has increased, and nobody had an action about it mm -hmm. so far. This need, this need to be changed. Uh, the only way we 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 suggested to the governorate is um, opening a castration center mm -hmm. and getting help from the professional people around the world. Uh, Mahu, one of the NGOs, had a visit to the uh, governorate here recently, and they are really capable to help the countries like this uh, to control the street dog and cat population. And I really want to see one day. When the, I see a children on the street, I want that children go to the animal and pet them, 
not hit them and throw them the rock. Uh, really, this uh, culture needs to be changed as well. Uh, so many other wishes I have, uh, but uh, I hope uh, like animal rights goes to the implementing and uh, the government uh, force uh, the other uh, the force the like uh, veterinarian uh, uh, offices and directors to apply those rules mm -hmm. and uh, like uh, police uh, the, uh, the police guys also applies all the rules are uh, in place yeah this is what i can say now today like to, to ask real quickly about uh, there's a somewhat of a public stigma about neutering here uh, before five years six years there was so many people against it because they say it is um, is religious why it's not allowed you you do this to an animal it's unfair as an emotionally i believe yes a little bit because really you cut up part of some hormones from any animals but when it comes to the community benefit in terms of animals and humans is the only way you can control the the street dogs and uh, street, ca street cats uh, so um now it's changed now it's different when you go to the veterinary office when you go to the government uh, governor right they they came the they came to that plan okay the only solution for today's street uh, and homeless uh, dogs and cats is only castration through our shelter and th through some other private shelters they started doing it but it doesn't cover because the number is very high like you need as i said you need uh, more uh, people and more uh, uh, help from outside and come and do it for you and help you how you doing it and I'd like to talk about, uh, again, to go back to your background, I'd like to talk about your family a little bit uh, because your sister works in Parliament. Mm -hmm. and she have a dog. And she has a dog, yeah. <laughs> which, which helps. Uh, <laughs> and your uh, father was the uh, culture minister. Yes. Uh, and so I was wondering, you, you have this family that's in the public sector and then you've chosen this area of advocacy. Yeah. You've kind of split off uh, in some ways. I was wondering what... what the, what happened? <laughs> yeah, uh, my father was uh, also politician. My sister also politician. But we complete each other because if I don't have them, uh, actually, my father passed away in two thousand and thirteen. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we complete each other. Why? My one of my old sisters is uh, she's a uh, uh, library manager, directorate, and she take care of the cats. She loves cats. Uh, we complete uh, each other because if I don't have them, uh, I can't send my voice somewhere. <laughs> uh, and they can feel me because they have a pet, pets at home. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, when even my dad, he was loving animals. Like he was even, uh, he had a respect for a small pest on the floor. He loves uh, environment, trees, flowers, sun, moon, everything in this planet. And he believes that we all need, in some point, to accept each other. Uh, this is, uh, that's why, uh, like, this part of me, uh, we all, uh, our sister have some. Uh, they all, every time they have an initiative, if they see a, a cat, a sick cat, or a sick dog, they every time have an initiative. So I believe we complete each other. And very nice that they differently work, and I different. My my patient is different because we come. Uh, otherwise, you cannot reach somewhere. I agree. I'm sure your father would be very very proud if he saw Thank you. Thank you. And Thank I'd, you. I'd like to thank you so much for coming in again, Ashti. Thank you for your time and highlighting this subject, this important subject to the community. <laughs>Thanks so much to Ashti Falakadin for coming in and speaking with us. Uh, I've gone ahead and put some organizations below that you might be interested in checking out. Uh, one of them is Dr. Suleiman's organization, the Kurdistan Organization for Animal Rights Protection. Uh, Dr. Suleiman has been another pioneer for animal rights in Kurdistan, so we hope to have more on him soon. Uh, the other organization is an organization Ashti works with as well uh, that she mentioned in the interview called War Paws, which is an international NGO dedicated towards rescuing and rehabilitating animals uh, that have survived conflict, uh, and they do fantastic work. Inside Kurdistan is brought to you by the Kurdistan Information Network, and the link to our website is also listed below. 
If you have any questions or comments about any of our episodes, uh, be sure to reach out to us at info at curtisdenin.net. And of course, uh, this podcast is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google, and a whole list of other platforms. So if you like what you hear, uh, please be sure to like and subscribe and tell your friends, family, or whoever about us. Thanks, of course, for listening. I've been Aaron Weintraub, and this has been Inside Curtis Dan. Inside Curtis Dan.